Yeah, well, it occurred to me that the clips we had done weren't entirely to my taste, the two loved ones, mm -hmm. um, and that, hey, I used to make stuff on my little Super 8 camera and so forth, why don't I make my own clips? And it, it was just absolutely fortuitous that at the time, um, alternative cinema was going strong in Auckland, which was something that was built by um, Jeff Stephen and Jeff Murphy and Merit Amita, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and they had this wonderful sort of communistic um, attitude whereby anybody who wanted to could go and use their gear for free and um, they'd give you a Bolex and some film that they got from you know, TVNZ short ends or whatever mm -hmm. um, and um, they would process it for you and you could use their flatbeds to edit it and so forth and it was just fantastic. Um, it was just this wonderful gift that just happened to be there at that time. Right. So I somehow I glommed onto them, I can't remember how, and um, made a clip for Nothing's Gonna Happen, which is off the first Tool Dwarfs EP. And um, yeah, that was great fun. That was a real communal effort, just with the whole flat really, not just Barbara, but with Doug Horrid and um, his partner of the time, um, uh, the, Carol, Carol Tippett, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And other people who were in it, like um, Bob Sutton and Richard Hanson, was just friends and family and so forth. So that was mostly pixelated, which is the animation of objects and people. And uh, yeah, that was just done over, I think, three, maybe four nights, okay. just getting people around and um, going, God, what can we do this time? Right. And someone would make a suggestion. Um, like someone suggested, oh, Bob could be eaten by a um, by a sleeping bag. Sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or um, my favourite bit in the whole clip was actually there's a little bit of Doug with a, a bag on his head just going across the floor. He's lying on the floor just yep. go, going across and there's just, just something beautiful about that little bit of animation that I really like. And then at the end we just set a roll of toilet paper on fire in the toilet and, you know, chopped up the mints and utterly random things really but these these were inspired by people like particularly um, Norman McLaren and Len Rye whose stuff I'd seen uh, as a kid I guess it must have been Len Rye on TV and Norman McLaren was uh, I saw at, um, at Film Society and they had both animated in camera and without camera mm -hmm. uh, and both those things became quite a thread throughout my clip making, but nothing's going to happen was particularly inspired by a couple of Norman McLaren shorts um, which animated people. The rhythm track was just me going, and that was slowed down a wee bit, I think. Um, so it was just a tape loop of that with sort of weird snaky guitar over the mm. top and this litany of. Um, of lyrics about politics and religion and the isms and racism and sexism mm -hmm. and stuff and that seemed like a sitter for uh, having images and my concept for that one was just to get a lot, whole lot of single images um, and just have a couple of frames of each image so mm -hmm. it would just be a constantly shifting kaleidoscope of images and that was I think probably influenced by um, a viewing of Frank's film which is this amazing film by a guy, Frank, somebody that I can't remember the second name, but everything in this film started with F, and there were just single frames of, of these things, and two soundtracks, one of which was, um, I think for memory, him and his wife arguing about the film, and the other one was just this list of words starting with F, and in stereo, and it was just fantastic, this great little film, I thought, oh, if you can make a film just out of these separate images rather than trying to animate them just having doo -doo 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 yeah. and it looked great so I did that but unfortunately and poor Richard Hansons who was in the previous clip was the person who got to hold all these these books and and separate pictures up while I you know took a couple of frames and after eight hours of doing this his arms were so sore but it was great you know people were happy to help in those right. days but when the film came back from processing I realized that <laughs> in my incompetence I had um, threaded the film badly mm -hmm. and the gate hadn't been fully clamped down um, so that 
when I was pausing between pictures and mm -hmm. the gate was still slightly open, so light was leaking mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I think that was a... No, no, sorry, that was a later problem. <laughs> no, that's right, the gate wasn't fully closed, so the film wasn't actually engaging properly, so every second frame was blurred, something like that. Right. So anyway, it was like all this work had sort of gone for naught, because it was just like, oh, it's all this blurry mess. What did you tell Richard? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Mm. I said, we're going to have to do it again, but then I thought, actually, no. I'll go back to Len Lai and, and take a feather out of his cloak and um, draw on it and scratch on it mm -hmm. um, on the frames that are a bit you know, mucked up. Right. So I did that, and that made the clip so much better. And I was just so happy at the end of that. I mean, it was painstaking work, and it was uh, it was eye straining, but it was so worth it. If it had been, if it had happened, if it had come out exactly like I had intended, it would have been quite a dull clip. Right. It's ironic, isn't it? Yeah. What did you do with all the images afterwards? They were in books and magazines oh, really? and stuff. Yeah. They went ripped out and stuff. But the nice thing, you know, my favourite moment in that in that clip is um, Leisha, who was two or three mm. at the time in this overexposed little shot of her just wandering around the front yard. Um, and because I was you know, drawing on it and so forth at, at that point, because the song was really bleak at that point, I just mm. inked in, there is always hope. And these words just sort of snuck across the screen. And you know, that made it for me, the fact that it actually had a positive ending. So if, it, if the film had turned out as it was supposed to do, it wouldn't have had that, which, um, Right. It would have spoiled it, really. It would have been, you know, just this bleak thing. I actually got a call from TVNZ, I think, saying, we love this song. Have you done a clip? No. Would you like to do a clip? Yes. We'll send you a crew for an afternoon. You can do whatever you like. Thanks. So they did. Um, they came to our house, and I just got a whole bunch of people in for the afternoon and um, had this idea whereby they'd just film me doing the song twice and mm -hmm. start in real big close up and then just slowly track out, pull back, um, to reveal at the very end all these people in the room. And we do it twice and intercut between them on the beat. Right. And then every time that happened there'd be a few mm -hmm. frames of the second version. Um, so it was real simple and didn't take long and uh, it was okay. Sometime in the 90s, I was approached um, by Gibson Group to do some work with them on an um, arts program they were putting together and to be the film reviewer, and that was great. Um, I really enjoyed that. I loved the audio cue, you know, because I've got bugger all memory. Short term right. memory is really shot. Um, so having an auto cue was great. <laughs> Trying to appear sort of vaguely erudite about films was the, um, the toughest bit because I don't really watch films like that I don't analyze films as I watch them in any way really I just uh, I just open my eyes wide and let them fall into my head you know, mm -hmm. um, and enjoy them as they run through and don't really give them much thought right so it was a, you know made me watch films in a slightly different way so there's, there's a bunch of film noirs and then um, sort of went sideways into horror movies, which was great, the old universal horrors and so forth. Uh, then went sideways again into comedy, which was not quite my cup of tea, Bob Hope and mm. the Crosby movies and stuff like that. But um, it really educated me in film noir, because that's a genre I hadn't actually given much time to in the past, but there was some great stuff out there. That was great, that was really good fun. I sent to southern India for an intrepid journey program and am just currently involved with a TV6 thing called New Artland as a front person, so right. that's my first real front person gig. Is there, is there an auto cue involved there? No, no, I've had to learn whole paragraphs and spout them to camera. Right. I don't like that bit one little bit. I figured out the other day that Max Media's actually been going for 21 years. It must be one of the longest running cartoons in New Zealand history. <laughs> I really Nobody knows about it. <laughs> it's just tucked away in the entertainment section once a week.